Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the Green Mountain Council. I have a volunteer of the board, and I'll call this meeting to order. The first item on the agenda is the executive director's report, and I'll call on Susan Barrett. Susan. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I have some meeting announcements for next week, and then I have some public comment announcements. First, I want to remind folks that next week the board will be holding hearings via Teams on the 2023 Qualified Health plan rate requests. Uh, so on Monday, July 18th, starting at 8 a.m., we'll hear from Blue Cross Blue Shield on their request. On Wednesday, July 20th, we'll hear from MVP starting at 8 a.m. on their request. And then on Thursday, July 21st, we will be holding a public forum on these uh, rate requests, and that is from 4 to 6 p.m. Again, all of this is via Teams. There will be a physical location via open, um, per open meeting law, and that is going to be at 144 State Street. But to uh, make clear that all of the meetings and the participants from the board and the um, insurers will uh, be participating th through Teams. I also uh, related, want to remind folks that we are taking public comment on these plans and these rate requests. Um, so we received these rate requests on May 6th. We opened up a public comment period that started on May 9th, and that will close this Thursday, July 21st at 11.59 p.m. So we'd encourage folks to make comments either electronically or through our website or through um, email, or you can always call the office to make those uh, comments. And all of that information is on our website. And then in terms of additional public comments, we also have a new public comment period starting today on the hospital budget submissions. So we will open that com comment period again today, July 13th, and we will run it through August 30th. Uh, information on the FY23 hospital budget review can be found on our website under public comments, as well as under the hospital um, budget page. The board will be holding public hospital budget hearings starting the week of August 15th, and the board's deliberations will begin on August 31st. So we ask that you submit your comments by the 31st in order to be considered by the board during its deliberations. I apologize for the barking dog. Um, we are also accepting public comments on, on V-Cures. Um, Hold on one moment. I think I should shut this door so you can actually hear me. I am so sorry. You're probably still going to be hearing him, but um, so we are accepting public comments on the reporting manual update for VCures, the Vermont All Payer Claims Database, and you um, can submit those comments on our website as well. We'll be holding a public hearing on Tuesday, August second, um, to discuss the changes. So uh, please, we want to hear from you on any of uh, your comments. And last but certainly not least is that we are conducting an ongoing public comment period on the next potential all payer model. Um, the uh, Agency of Human Services and the governor's office are leading those negotiations on a subsequent model, on the all payer model. Uh, so we will share any of those comments with them. And I will gladly turn it back over to you, Chair Mullen, so you don't have to listen to the barking dogs. Thank you, Susan. The next item on the agenda are the minutes of Wednesday, June 22nd. Is there a motion? So moved. Second. It's been moved and seconded to approve the minutes of Wednesday, June 22nd, without any additions, deletions, or corrections. Is there any discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor of the motion, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed, please signify by saying nay. Let the record show that the motion carried unanimously.
At this point, the main purpose of today's uh, meeting is to talk about uh, uh, hospitals and quality, and I'm going to turn the meeting over to our own Michelle Degree to tee it up for us. So, Michelle, whenever you're ready. Okay. Can you guys hear me okay? We can. I see nodding heads. Okay. It's always weird in the office because you hear yourself about six times around you. <laughs> uh, thank you all for uh, giving us the opportunity to talk today. I'm just going to do a really brief introduction and then let VPQ really run um, the rest of this meeting to talk about the work group that the board participated in. So a little bit of background. Um, this uh, meeting series, this quality framework meeting series stemmed from an Office of Rural Health grant proposal way back at the beginning of March in 2021. Uh, Elena and I worked with VPQ to submit a proposal um, for funding for some of this work. And then what you're about to hear is sort of the after effects of some of that. So the, the whole work group process, um, the measures that were determined. So I should probably tell you what it was for. Uh, the purpose of the grant application itself was to support collaboration between at this point specifically VPQ and GMCB to assemble um, a uniquely designed hospital quality framework that we could eventually work to incorporate into our board's regulatory processes, so namely hospital budgets. Um, and the uh, information that Ali, I believe I see, Ali, I see Ali's name, but I see Kathy's face, so I'm not sure <laughs> is going to present to you, uh, is just sort of about the those meetings and the end results, which um, we're sort of using our platform here as an opportunity for uh, further public comments. So um, the board itself will provide comment back to VPQHC um, that'll run through me and Susan, uh, but this is an opportunity for others to sort of hear about the work if they weren't involved and to comment and um, that way VPQ has an opportunity to incorporate any feedback before the close of this period, which I believe is the end of August, uh, but I'm sure Ali will correct me if I am wrong. So with that, I'll turn it over to, to VPQ. Great. Thank you, Michelle, for that great introduction and that background on the project and for providing the venue today to share um, the results of our, our efforts to date. During our time today, uh, I hope to do three things. Um, talk about the, dif the difficulties with hospital care quality measurement in Vermont being a small and rural state. Share the collaborative approach we used and in designing a framework for monitoring that quality of care and invite suggestions for improving the framework. And in terms of the timeline, I was kind of hoping for a two week period. The close of this project is end of August. And so I'd like a little time to incorporate the feedback into the final report, but uh, we can negotiate that offline. <laughs> so I can start with the presentation. I'm looking at it on hard copy, but you're not looking at it yet. So please bear with me. Okay. So as Michelle described, this, this work is funded through uh, the Vermont Department of Health's Office of Rural Health and Primary Care. We're very grateful for that support. And this presentation will cover an introduction. So a little bit about myself and the project the observed need, a description of the problem that we are trying to solve, the collaboration, the people who came together to work on the project and how we organized ourselves, the activities, so how we tackled the problem, the result, I'll show you the first draft really of the measure set, which is part of the Vermont Hospital Quality Framework we're drafting, and public comment, an invitation to share ways for improving the draft framework. So for those of you who I haven't met, um, my name is Allie Johnson. I am new to VPQHC. I joined in December as a quality improvement specialist. After retiring from state service, I served 25 years at the Vermont Department of Health, mostly in cancer surveillance and research. So my background is in database management, epidemiology, program management, and having, having um, been a 
founding member of Vermonters Taking Action Against Cancer, our statewide cancer coalition. Um, I have lots of experience in garnering consensus and stakeholders and um, trying to really find measures that mark how well we're doing to move the marble on a big public health problem, in that case, such as cancer. So really excited to be part of the VPQHC team and um, to share about the project. The purpose of this is to design a framework of meaningful metrics that provide relevant information and accurately reflects the hospital system's quality of care within the healthcare reform environment in Vermont. So a uh, little bit of a tall order, but I have, we have a huge group who helped with this and we're continuing to work. So the observed need, what, what problem exists that we're trying to solve? Well, as this group knows, there are so many possible measures out there for hospital care quality. Um, and there are lots of report cards and ways of uh, publishing all these different metrics, and it tends to create confusion. Um, so we are hoping to do more alignment among regulators, um, but kind of have a, a gathering place where consume all different kinds of um, individuals, consumers, policymakers, regulators, healthcare professionals can come and quality professionals can come to understand how well Vermont hospitals are providing care. So here are like a dozen of the different hospital quality reporting programs the hospitals are you know, involved with. And you know, part of our work is trying to minimize the impact on um, hospital quality professionals in terms of sharing data and and, and submitting data, we we found mostly passive ways of obtaining the information to ease that burden. So in doing this work, these are considerations, or as I like to think of them, constraints in the equation. Um, things just to keep in mind, and there are three of these slides, so this kind of might be a lot, but as, as we I mentioned, hospitals are engaged in many healthcare quality programs, and there are many platforms out there that display the data. Uh, many report cards claim to speak to hospitals' quality of care, but not all of those report cards are created equal. And part of what we did in our group process was un, um, listen to an analysis by Jason Miner from UVM and the Jeffords Quality Institute, um, where the different report cards were kind of graded based on national criteria. And so that kept kept us thinking about, well, what what best practice do we want to use for our report cards, our report card, our framework? Of course, Vermont is unique and any proposed measures must take Vermont's unique characteristics, typically being small, being rural, into consideration. And Vermont statute tasks at least three organizations that we know of um, in assessing the quality of health care delivered across the system. And so I've linked the statutes that relate to the Green Mountain Care Board, the Vermont Department of Health, and the Vermont Program for Quality and Health Care. And uh, I, I've seen that this presentation is available online, and so participants can access the statutes um, by these links if you'd like. So best practice is to convene a multi-stakeholder committee to select the measures and determine a process for ensuring that any set of measures continues to stay relevant in this environment. Um, and as part, as part of the budget review process, the, we understand that the limitations of any quality framework must be made explicit and hospitals must be able to tell the story behind the metric. So that's sort of setting the stage um, and Susan or, um, or Chair Mullen, how, how should we handle questions? Should we wait until the end? I, I'd prefer to wait to the end if possible. And then, sure. um, we'll start with the board first and then we'll go to public comment. Okay, great. Then I won't solicit any until the end. <laughs> Thank you. I meant to ask that earlier. So I want to share, um, a graphic now of all the individuals and organizations that came together to work on this problem. 
And you can see five sectors of healthcare represented here, government, insurers, education and research, mm -hmm. hospitals and providers, and consumers. Um, and so there are 56 individuals who participated, representing 25 organizations. I'm really happy to say that we had actually four consumer representatives on, on the team. And, you know, just kind of a takeaway for me at this point in the process is I realized that inclusion and consensus um, are related and sometimes inversely. And this process erred on the side of inclusion. <laughs> so we, we did get some consensus, but just keep in mind the size of this collaboration um, as we share some of the proposals with you. So how do we organize ourselves? Um, we have a work group charter that, that has the purpose of the group, the business case, the scope of work, the schedule, um, and well, we have an appendix that's work group members and processes, and we have a whole list of resources that I'll show you a screenshot of um, that we keep on the VPQHC website. There's a little document portal that work group members are privy to. Um, before before getting into what our work group did, I, I'd like to recognize the the work that Michelle mentioned early on, um, the VPQHC team, Green Mountain Care Board staff, and Vermont Association for Hospitals and Health Systems for laying the groundwork for this project in their August 20, well, in their, sounds like March 2021 uh, proposal, but August 2021 report, building a hospital quality framework. I mean, this was all done before I joined the organization in December. And so I had a wonderful um, start, you know, a kind of a project that was already packaged and just ready to jump into. And I'm really grateful for that. So here's our work group timeline. Um, you can see that it's just the months of January through August of 2022. And I have these satisfying check marks uh, to take you through the timeline and our activities. So we convene the work group and establish the work group charter early on. We also set some meeting guidelines, and I think they worked really well in the meeting facilitation in terms of being able to bring different um, voices and perspectives to the process. We realized early on that our membership lacked diversity, and so we recruited new members to try to round out that representation. We had some orientation to the Institute of Medicine's six domains of healthcare quality. We inventoried current measures, you know, all of those, well, the three statutes and all of the material I showed you all these different reporting programs and hospital requirements, we said, what, what are we already collecting? We also um, fielded a survey of work group members asking what measure, what measure um, programs are you participating in and how are you using quality measures like this? Um, we reviewed the survey data and we had, we proposed measures and um, in May we evaluated or scored the proposed measures and I'll share the scoring criteria with you in a minute. Um, we finalized the proposed measures. It was more like July than June, but it's, it's still a check mark. And here we are submitting for public um, comment. And so happy to be at this point in the timeline. Um, by this Friday, um, I will have something on our portal and I'll have directions to that in this presentation. I'll have something on the portal. It'll be um, the draft list of measures that we are accepting um, feedback on. And so then I'll be compiling integrating public comments into August and, and running it by the work group membership to get the final draft to the health department by the end of August to meet our deliverable. It's been a real whirlwind and I'm really delighted to say that many of the people on this call were involved and um, many others to be, uh, to show my, Real appreciation for speaking of appreciation. Many thanks to our presenters. We had six different pr presentations over the course of six months um, to just show various perspectives of what's important to um, the different sectors of healthcare, healthcare quality. 
So this is a screen capture of our document portal and it, this is not even complete. So we have lots of resources that were um, studied and used and to understand the evidence for quality measurement and um, best practice. And you'll see in the lower right hand portion of the slide, there is a link to this, to this portal. Well, it's a link to this page and then you have to go to the portal and then put in our um, secret squirrel password of framework one, two, three. This was, um, it's just a way to kind of, it, so it's clearly not private, it's just a way for people who are very intentional in this type of work to have access to all these materials. Okay, so a couple of considerations for proposing measures. Um, you know, I mentioned that assessment we did where we inventoried all the measures. So we wanted to say, okay, let's start with what hospitals are already doing. And so we know we have Act 53, also known as the Vermont Hospital Report Card. And again, these are all parameterized links. So I encourage participants to go and look at these different um, ways of displaying hospital quality data. Uh, the Medicare Beneficiary Quality Improvement Project and hospital level metrics under Vermont's all payer model. So we put all of those in a basket. These are the technical guides to the data dictionaries and how these measures are um, described and calculated and the rationale for capturing them. And then we looked for, we looked to other resources. Um, if there were topics identified by the work group that were very important to collect, mental health is a really good one. Um, where there weren't really existing measures, we had to we had to continue looking for them. And these are some of the places that we looked. Uh, the National Quality Forum. We followed the Rural Health Work Group. Um, recommendations, the CMS measures, inventory tool, and the National Quality Forum's Developing Health Equity Measures report. Um, <laughs> that actually, <laughs> that was published in 2012. During the six months of this work, um, the National Quality Forum took down their health equity, um, like they had described certain measures as being health disparity sensitive as a, like a quality of each of the measures that is in their big database. And um, they stopped doing that partway through this process. So luckily I had captured that little, that information early on, but that was, um, that was a resource for us for a while. So here are the scoring criteria I mentioned earlier. First, they have to be feasible to collect. So, um, we looked at whether measures were required by critical access hospitals, larger hospitals. We looked at whether it was important to collect. So had the work group identified it as a priority, does it align with these hospital reporting programs that hospitals are already involved with? Does it meet the NQF endorsement criteria? Being a small rural state, we thought the measure needed to, each measure needed to be rural relevant and resistant to low case volume. I mean, as it is, you know, with our hospital report card, just due to the small number of cases for certain measures, some hospitals have no data to report or display um, just due to low case volume. So we were looking for measures that could be reported by the highest number of, of hospitals possible. And the group thought it was really important to have an established pathway for how a hospital could affect a measure. And so you'll see on the final list, there are a few measures that are kind of these systems measures that have to do with transitions in care that are hard to know how to attribute to the sending hospital or the receiving hospital. Um, and so those are a little bit aspirational, I would say, in terms of a type of measure, because we're still figuring out how like the sending hospital could influence a measure if the receiving hospital doesn't have beds for a certain kind of patient. Um, so this is, this is, you know, a lot, of, a lot of things to consider here. So basically, in a nutshell, we had 44 measures that met some basic criteria and aligned with the Institute of Medicine's six aims for healthcare quality. That was really important. We wanted to represent each of those domains. 
We wanted to have a mixture of um, process, outcome, and systems measures. And we wanted to have the measures be in topic areas that were important to collect. So we took these measures. We um, The match scores are, we had three quality professionals um, compare the measures to the scoring criteria and come up with a score. We then shared that out with the work group members in a survey and um, provided the evidence base for each of the measures. The work group had this survey. They kind of voted on within each domain the most important measures to collect. And then we had a final review. Um, Dr. Don Dupuy from Copley Hospital was the sole volunteer from the work group. And we, we um, corrected a couple of things and we took out a couple of um, payment measures that were going to be too difficult to collect and added a couple of readmission measures. So um, that shook out to 18 measures, which was perfect because the work group um, had been surveyed very early on in this process about the number of measures to collect and they wanted to keep it under 20. And so we did it. So, okay, the result you've all been waiting for. Um, here, so they're basically, <laughs> so my presentation boils down to two slides. Um, here are the first three of the um, domains, the Institute of Medicine's healthcare quality domains. And um, here are the measures. I, and I'm not, I'm not really, I think, going to spend um, time, I guess, on each measure other than to say um, this will be, this presentation is publicly available. I can provide more information upon request behind how this measure is, um, how it is calculated and where the data source would be and, and so on. Equity though, I will say was a really interesting one. Um, I actually presented this too and I want to get the name of this organization correct. Um, the Health Disparities and Cultural Competence Advisory Group. I met with them a couple of times to ask about health equity, since this is really um, an emerging area of healthcare quality measurement. And we understand that screening for preferred spoken language for healthcare will be an aspirational measure because um, claims and electronic health records may or may not, in hospital practice may all vary on this. So it may be hard to compare, um, but we wanted to include, this was the best equity measure we came up with and this council agreed, um, had a great conversation with them. And we understand that the um, social determinants of health is an emerging area too for data collection. So the final three, um, domains, patient-centeredness, safety, and timeliness. Um, and, you know, you know, you might, if you're in this world and in this kind of work day-to-day, -day, you'll see that many of these are already in the um, hospital report card that the Vermont Department of Health publishes. So um, behind the scenes, there is a spreadsheet that contains um, all of these characteristics for each of these measures. And I've worked with Terry Hata from the Vermont Department of Health. She may be on the call. So kudos to Terry for reviewing all of the measures, making sure I have this metadata correct um, for each of them and identifying the data sources. So that's the list of measures. The framework, I think of the framework as list of measures plus the portal um, or the way of displaying the measures. And so we only have the list of measures really available for public comment at this point, but I wanted to share that we do plan to have this comparative way of displaying data. Um, and it, we might also call it a dashboard. We want it to be easy to find, easy to use, have uh, good explanations about what we're measuring and and uh, stories behind the curve. If hospitals are doing particularly well, we want other hospitals to be able to scale what what the you know the um, high achiever is doing, so that they may improve quality in their hospital too. We want to have appropriate benchmarks. Um, 
and be able to display observed versus expected values. Hospitals reported they really want to be able to show their own individual trends. So we'll have a way to do that too. And something that's not on this slide is that we kind of want to have a landing page that's very consumer friendly that might point out to other resources for things that might not have gotten on the list. For example, patient safety, um, surveillance system, and um, and being able to like pay pay for your bills. The Vermont Healthcare Advocate is helping us with that. So um, I, this is the part where I'd like to invite um, ways to improve the draft framework. Um, so here are the instructions again by by Friday. Expect to have this link that is pointed to with a blue arrow parameterized. So there would be a document behind that. This is the link you would use to access the landing page where comments are due. And it will basically be just an email to me. Um, you know, I just, before wrapping up, wanted to say that this is an iterative process. This was a first try. We understand this is not gonna be the end all be all final product of having a, a quality framework, but it was a really good first try and it was very inclusive. Um, you know, we understand that more outcome measures of high quality and reliability are needed. My door is open to continue the conversation and we're going to see after August how the work will be continued with the Vermont Department of Health and, and what comes next for the work group. That's still kind of to be determined. You know, we've, re we've recognized for, for next time these two um, types of measures, uh, measurement reporting systems that didn't go into the original framework and will absolutely be considered more next time. Um, and are there any questions? So thank you very much. Uh, we'll start with board questions and members of the board. Um, I guess I'll go in reverse alphabetical order and start with Tom Walsh. Uh, thank you, Kevin, and thank you, Ali. <clears throat> um, great job convening the, so many stakeholders, right? That's um, an important aspect to this, and I think um, sometimes when we we go to great lengths to convene stakeholders, it gets hard to satisfy every stakeholder, <laughs> uh, and that can be difficult. I um, So just job well done, and I look forward to seeing more. Um, I, I was wondering, though, if you could explain a little bit more about the surgical outcomes and the promise measures and uh, what what's behind the decision to leave those for next time. They were not introduced early on, so they didn't go through the rigor of being considered, scored, um, okay. and surveyed. Okay. So I just didn't think that... Um, it would respect the process and timeline to just sort of whop them in at the end. Got it. Okay. Um, one of the things um, that I thought you might say is, is that oh. the way that we prioritized, um, we've gotten to 19, we're trying to stay below 20, and each of those items that are linked um, has multiple measures within it. And so how, yes, would we, right. how would we meet our goal of staying below 20? Um, so mm -hmm. if it does come down to trying to decide what might be cut, I did notice that um, I think it's in the effectiveness bucket or the first bucket. There are three measures of 30 day readmission. There's yes. overall readmission, there's heart and there's pneumonia. And I don't know that there's really much added information by comparing heart versus pneumonia and going with just the overall 30 day readmission might get you know, 90% of what we need. And so we could free up two places um, with that type of thinking. And mm -hmm, I think mm -hmm. if, we went, if we went through the whole list thinking like that, we may be able to um, include more of the uh, surgical outcome measures where there's so much of the cost in healthcare, um, discretionary cost particularly is around that area um, and patient reported outcome measures which um, I believe in my understanding of the literature is that that's an area that's gonna become more important uh, when it comes to focusing on equity. 
if we're asking all patients, patient reported outcome measures, and then we stratify by socioeconomic status or variable, then we get more insight into what's actually happening to individuals in different strata. And so are the promise measures are the, um, able to be stratified by um, demographic information? I, I'm not sure that the age caps, the that's another patient reported um, yeah. type of measure. I'm not sure those are able to be stratified. There, we need to do work to do that. Mm. If we're collecting them within the state, and then we can marry that with other data sets that have um, variables for uh, gender, race, ethnicity, income, education, those type of things, we can do the stratification. Uh, so it's, it's just, this is a really great start. And um, there's a lot to be um, proud of with what you've done and how you've done it. Um, and so I hope we keep going. And thank you for being part of this. Yeah, it's been a pleasure. Okay, next we'll go to board member Pelham. Tom? Well, this is uh, dizzying, if I can get the word out right. Um, you know, it's, it's uh, data is, I mean, I'm just thinking about my experience coming on the board and, you know, kind of poking around in all these little corners to find out what's going on and kind of looking at the, uh, I think it's the U.S. Census data on cost per capita, you know, and uh, the, the data was 20 for 2014 and in 2017 that still seemed kind of relevant, but now it's irrelevant because mm. it's, it's old data. And um, so, you know, my sense is, is that this is a moving environment all the time, you know, and a um, moving environment that <clears throat> can't be um, uh, followed, you know, uh, with any sense of currency. Um, you've got, yeah. you know, disease incidents changing over time. You know, you look at some of our stuff in, in the uh, all-payer model having to do with um, pre-diabetes and, you know, the, the data changes over time and people want to be current. You have, like, reform in infrastructure. You know, to me, um, fixed perspective payments are very important, but three years from now, they might not be important at all. You know, so it's kind of stuff comes and goes. And I'm kind of sitting here thinking about my experience in Arlington with the Arlington Memorial uh, uh, Dorothy Canfield Library, and that 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 may be a model that is uh, where there is a few librarians that are neutral about the data, uh, but are just there to be traffic cops. You know, they they know what the data is, what its relevance is, and can. Um, uh, their appeal will be that they can shorten the timeline that it takes people to get up to speed with what it is that they want to know. Um, and, uh, you know, you know, I could go into the library in Arlington and my mom could too and say, I want a book about this. I want a book about that. And they knew where it was. You know, they okay. could tell you kind of what was in it, but they weren't experts on it. Um, and I, and uh, so if some kind of a, you know, dashboard could be created, you um, or, or uh, you know, kind of a a, a a a system where where people are directed um, in directions that will be helpful to them, um, and also directed in directions where there is relationship building. I mean, for certain periods of time, certain things might be important to a certain group of people. Then three years later, you know, whatever that importance was has dissolved, and people have new moved on. So not only kind of you know, directing people toward data uh, that is value added, but also directing them toward people who have a common interest, you know, that can share, share the effort of, uh, of, of you accessing and utilize that, that data. I just, I just worry that trying to set, um, you know, for a certain set of standards or metrics, you know, boiling it down to a specific number uh, is really a, um, you know, a, a uh, over time is a process that that can be very diff difficult to to sustain, um, and you know, so I, I, I you know, 
uh, I, I can't be very helpful here. I just I think about my own hunting and uh, pecking experiences, trying to sort through all the data that's available, you know, and then boil it down to what's what's in my view, and it's a personal view, what's the data that is important to a critical path um, and of, 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 of getting, you know, change uh, affected or getting to understand the nuances of, of an issue. And, you know, the, the, I don't think that there's any system that can keep pace with that, um, except a system where there are very capable people in a well understood place that understood where the data is mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. uh, can direct people to it so they can work with it however it is that they want to work with it, but at least they're aware of it. Um, so I kind of wish you luck. Um, I, Thank you. I, I think, you know, this will be a, a, a point in time experience. Um, and uh, I think focusing on how to take this experience and make it, give it a life that keeps on giving. And uh, I'm not quite sure a dashboard does that. I think that's human beings, you know, in a central place that understand all the data, you know, sources that there are. Can Someone can walk in the door and say, I'm really interested in this and uh, can be told, well, go there, go there, go there. Or maybe the Middlebury College Library has some important stuff. Just people that know kind of where the data is, but aren't, um, married to it they they're, they're just you know good librarian traffic types but it's, yeah, this uh, is reminding me of the health department's data encyclopedia where they have this information about what what each data set contains what some of the um the the ba barriers are to each data set or um you know ways that it might be used might not be used um and who's in charge who you can contact for more data for more information and for more data and yep. um that's like one little nugget of all the data that are available related to health that's more of the public health data sets but some healthcare, and yeah so a resource like that might be helpful i'm hoping that vpqhc can continue to be kind of a neutral place where, um, yeah, where this information can be um, warehoused. Well, that sounds like a natural, in my understanding or sense, for v v v P VPQHC, you know, is this, you know, they're, they're the, the data warehouse. They know where it all is, um, and they're not judgmental about it, um, and can point people in directions that, you know, help them uh, get acquainted with and use the data that's available. We'll keep doing our best. Thank you. Okay, next we'll turn to board member lunch, Robin. Hi, thank you very much, Allie, for the presentation. Um, I guess my question was whether during the course of the process, the group discussed um, the ways which the framework might be used and by whom and if you could give a little sense of that discussion and um and what ideas came out from the group yes gladly great question thanks we talked a number of times about audience so who are we trying to reach um and we we voted on this we discussed it I, that is one of the areas I'm not sure we ever came to consensus on. So the group pro, the group purpose was initially kind of a purist thing of we want um, a set of measures that represents that is representative of the quality of care um, that hospitals are providing. We want the quality professionals at that those hospitals to be able to tell their story. <laughs> so when asked. When I asked the group about the audience, you would think the answer would be quality professionals at every hospital, but the answer kept coming back to consumers. Um, but evidence shows consumers don't use dashboards to make um, care decisions, particularly in um, acute situations. But we just kind of, <laughs> so the answer is still a little bit to be determined. We're, we're really trying to 
we tried to pin that down during this process. Um, we expect the dashboard to be be kind of consumable by anyone. And so we want the front facing part of this to be very consumer friendly. And we hope that the metrics provided will be helpful to a broad audience. Does that answer your question? Yes, I was just trying to see sort of the connection from where you started, which sounds like something that we might use in our hospital budget process to where you landed. Um, which still may help us get there, but obviously there's more steps that would need to happen before that takes place. So I was just trying to understand what the group itself wanted or thought the data would be useful for. Well, and we were thinking about the hospital budget process. I mean, I think what you're you're getting to is value. So um, quality over price. And we, our chart, work group charge specifically omitted any financial consideration. And so I think it will be a challenge moving forward to compare cost and quality in a meaningful way um, where those two things are really tied for each hospital that you can kind of connect a line there. Um, it was a little bit outside the scope of this round. Thank you. Okay, next we'll go to board member Holmes, Jessica. Great, thank you. Uh, I echo my colleagues, thanks and pulling all this together. And I know there was a lot of work in, in herding cats of that size in terms of <laughs> building consensus. I can appreciate all the hard work. Um, I have a couple questions uh, one, and comments, I suppose, um, if you're think soliciting feedback, um, yeah. is, as I know you are. Uh, one of the, my concerns, I guess, is, and I recognize the issue, but in the scoring criteria, one of the you know, scoring criteria is resistant to low case volume. Mm -hmm. Fully understand why you would want to do that. Low N can cause statistical issues with, with measurement. But those are some of the cases I worry the most about, consistently not mm -hmm. reporting where there's low case volume um, to the degree that we know that there, and I've talked about this at lots of board meetings, but we know that there's a volume quality relationship. And so... Um, what I would love to see is in a quality framework is at least some reporting of instances of low volume cases where we know the evidence is strong that those low volumes are often associated with poorer outcomes for patients. So, so are you saying reporting, oh, hey, this is an instance where there's a hospital that's doing really low volume on this particular case, and we know that there's a relationship between volume and quality. So um, and it's falling below standard um, measures of minimum volumes to maintain quality. So something like okay. some way we can measure that. I'm just for clarity. Are you talking about procedure, the numbers of procedures? So a quality measure might be the number of complications over the number of procedures. Are you saying that we should report out when we have um, like less than five, less than a threshold um, of those complications? Or are you saying we should report out um, hospital or, you know, we should report out for probably for all hospitals the the number of procedures, the, the denominator essentially, even though yes, it's small. in instances where we might be worried about that number falling below uh, a, a case number that, I'll, I'll give an example of, okay. an, you know, orthopedic knee replacements, joint replacements, right? When that number falls below a certain threshold that's widely accepted in the medical oh, literature. Oh, got it, okay. Um, either at the hospital level or at the provider level, I think that's, worthy of understanding and reporting out in terms of inequality framework, that those numbers have fallen below widely accepted procedure numbers to maintain, you know, certain levels of quality. I think that's the flip of understand, you know, thinking about we do live in a rural state where we are going to have low case volumes. When do we worry about low case volumes, I guess, is, is, uh, is what I think mm. at least would be helpful to think about in this quality framework. Um, it's at least it's some to some degree. Um, you know, I think births is an area, and that's again, that's an issue of quality and access. But there are areas where we start to worry about the births falling below some critical threshold, 
And when do we worry about that? And I'm not a, a, a medical provider and I, I, I can't, I don't know what those numbers are, but there's evidence out there. And so, you know, how can we start to incorporate those types of measures of, of quality in a different way when it comes to case numbers, where we know there's that volume case. Yeah, relation. I appreciate that insight. So we we don't want to appear of like sort of, well, la, la, we can't hear you about small numbers, it, it, right? And we want to be able to um, represent that as well. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Um, and I, I would echo uh, my colleagues, you know, uh, Tom's concern or interest in surgical outcomes, I guess I would say. I think, you know, uh, to the degree that that's still a priority going forward, it would be a priority for me. I think a lot of the data that's in this framework is data that, that is publicly available. What's not been really widely available or understood, or at least it's from my perspective, is surgical outcome data. Um, that's not something that we can easily find, identify, understand, um, revision surgeries. That's not something that we know about. Um, so that would be a huge value add, I think, of this framework, because that data is not already out there in all the other various. I know you had a great slide of all the places where there's data that comes in. Surgical outcome data, I don't think is is in many of those, um, some of them, complication rates and infection rates. But I, I think that there's probably a bucket there that's that's less full in some ways. Is that right or am I wrong? <laughs> yes. And surgical outcome data, so surgical outcomes were a priority very on, early on in the group. We attempted to find sources of information for this throughout the process. The two sources I mentioned at the very end became revealed after the measure list was finalized. So, uh, and one of them that I've looked into just very briefly um, only has three hospitals reporting. So it's such a, there are a lot of constraints in the equation and to try to have it be representative of the whole system, you know, yeah. of the topic areas that you want, it's, um, a lot to kind of balance. And I think if, if the group, I mean, so I think that's us, uh, Kathy's had her hand up. Did she oh, want to elaborate on that? Um, I just want to throw in also um, regarding the uh, National Surgical Quality Improvement Program, the, the Surgical Outcomes Database is the gold standard in, um, I, I would say, uh, just in overall, but very specific to surgical and surgical outcomes is a wonderful system and organization, very, two things, expensive and labor intensive to collect that data. A number of years back, um, yeah, some of you may not be familiar, would be um, since you've been, uh, prior to your arrival with the board, VPQHC worked with a number of Vermont hospitals, um, both you know, large, medium, and small, on, on the NISQIP project under the SIM grant. And you know the, that support was no longer available, but it was very extensive to get that system in place, and you know would take a commitment of resources to be able to do that. But you know if that becomes a priority and we can find a pathway to funding, um, it would be great to reinstitute that. But at you know the the resources to um, to submit uh, data to NISQIP. Um, you know, it's, as Ali said, three hospitals continue to do it because they prioritize that information within their organization's, um, you know, service lines and, and um, uh, you know, quality improvement programs. So um, just wanted to make you aware of that. Thank you, Kathy. No, that's hugely helpful. And it's something that in the past we've brought up and talked about maybe having, you know, is there a funding source? Would we um, allow, you know, how could we incorporate consideration of NISQIP funding in our hospital budget process to incentivize hospitals to do it? So if the if the group decides that this actually would be a useful gold standard that we should have all hospitals contributing to, maybe there are some mechanisms by which we can incent uh, hospitals to do so if it's truly going to be informative and all of that. So creative opportunities to think about how do we incent and fund um, you know, adherence to and submission of NISQIP data and all of that would be, I think, a great area of exploration. Um, 
Just a quick question under the effectiveness bucket, when we are talking about 30-day readmission rates, do, when you say hospital-wide, do you mean system-wide or is it readmission just back to the same hospital or does it capture readmission to any hospital? Uh, and how uh, we, I believe it. Like, yeah. I believe it is the same hospital. Kathy, could you please correct me if I'm wrong? <laughs> I think you're on Oop. mute. Yep. <laughs> there we go. Yes, um, do, due to the current limitations in the way our data systems can track that information, um, we're kind of limited to um, you know, returns, readmissions to the same organization. And I think that's where um, I think if if it wasn't the most recent meeting, uh, maybe two Green Mountain, Green Mountain Care Board meetings ago when we talked about um, Vital's new regional relationship that gives me great hope that we'll be able to get into larger data sets to be able to conduct um, those more comprehensive analyses and you know being able to do that just within our state as well. That would be fantastic. I think that would be helpful. I think you know yeah. if the patient doesn't return back to the same hospital but goes to a different hospital because of a whole host of reasons that would be just as important to track in terms of quality. So if there's, you know, let's maybe put a placeholder and hopeful that we can get that data in the future. Um, and my last comment point would just be in the dashboard. Um, you mentioned uh, alley benchmarks, and I think it would be really helpful to have, um, at least from my perspective, what are the triggers that raise concerns? You know, like almost like a red, yellow, green. When is it red? When is this <laughs> quality measure red and something to be concerned about? And to Robin's point, then we have to figure out, well, what are we going to do with the data and what does it mean when it's red? But um, I do think, you know, understanding what is the benchmark, but then how, when you're far off, how far off the benchmark do you have to be where you've got red flags? So I think, you know, and color coding is wonderful, right? Red, yellow, green is often just very easy visually and appealing and understandable by everybody, hopefully. So... And we'll need a lot more input from our quality partners on that. They, there was some discussion about benchmarking, and it's going to really depend on the measure, whether hospitals want to compare to their own past performance, to a state average, to a national average, regional. So more to, more to come on benchmarks, but I'm, I think I'm very um, understanding of your suggestion, so thank you. Great. Thank you so much. I really appreciate all this work, and I'm looking forward to seeing more and hearing more and figuring out how we can use it. Okay. Thanks for having me. So at this point, before I go to public comment, I wanted to uh, tell everyone that um, we will have uh, a portal on the site for public comment on what people have seen so far and any suggestions on how to improve that. And just to reinforce uh, the previous conversation with board member Holmes, we've all heard so many stories about someone um, who had what they believed was less than quality care and went to a different place the second and sometimes the third time. And, um, you know, the old adage, um, fool me once, shame on you, fool me twice, shame on me. I think we're all kind of ingrained where if we're not happy with what the outcome was with the first place we go, we go elsewhere. So it, that's uh, such an important piece to track and readmissions of any kind um, really are, are inefficiencies in the system. So with that, I'll open it up to public comment. Does any member of the public wish to comment at this time? The first hand up I see is Walter Carpenter. Uh, thanks, Kevin. Um... Jessica echoed my thoughts on the low volume care, so I won't, so I'll, I'll let that lie. I just wanted to ask, what are we going to do with all this data? I mean, this healthcare system in America and Vermont has so much data that we could walk to the moon and back from it if we stretched it out on a line. So what are we going to do with this data? Well, well the I hope is that we would hold people's feet to the fire, Walter, and uh, basically uh, hold them accountable for data that shows where some improvement could be made at their particular hospital. I and think how most would we do hospitals. That? And how would I think we when do you that? Start having a conversation in public about something, things start to happen. Mm -hmm. Walter. Yeah. 
<laughs> and uh, Walter, this is Kathy, if I can just jump in there. And I, I think a lot of the features that Ali presented, um, you know, for example, um, the ability to apply benchmarks is how then individual organizations understand where their position, like I'll call it where their position in the pack is. Are they a leader? Are they mid-pack? Are they kind of falling behind? And that helps give um, information. We take the data, turn that in, into information that becomes useful in informing organizational priorities, statewide improvement projects, local improvement projects. So the, the idea of all of this, and, and you know, we first set out with this project really committed not to adding to the burden of data collection and reporting, but making, making um, effective use of what's available to look at a more systemic picture and then be able to identify gaps, duplications, and areas for potential improvement. So I hope that answers your question. And um, I just want to reiterate, I think what everyone said many times, this will be an iterative process. This is version one coming out of the gate with um, hearing all the input of more than 50 contributors to this work. And I think I think this um, initial um, sharing, the, this initial part of the process to hear all the voices was so essential. And you know th that we have that memorialized in many of the documents. Um, the documents are available on our portal. We're happy to share, and um, we we intend to uh, work collaboratively with our partners to keep this moving forward with future. You know, version two, version three, version four. Okay. Next, I'm going to turn to Ham Davis. Ham. Thank you, Kevin. Uh, I'll try to keep this brief, but there's a huge just air of total unreality here. I don't know the, what the process that Ms. Johnson is talking about, but I can tell you that we have formed, we formed, I was the founder of, one of the founding members of PPQ and C in, 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 in 1988. Okay, we had, we went through all of these issues. We, had, in fact, had a, a huge statewide con uh, convention with all of the players, hundreds of people there. The reality is, the reality is, and, and Walter Carpenter has just got it. You've you got to listen to Walter here. The reality is, first of all, that nobody in the hospital business wants anything to do with public quality because it can make them look bad. And you already have data like this. You it, it, this data, the data exists. You have right now that it came into you last October 27th. You have I forget which consultant it was. It was a whole bunch of consultants. But there's a province that listed at least four hospitals that is that are doing surgical procedures well under the leapfrog the leapfrog volume rule, where there's just too few to be they do they they do them anyway. They have, I've heard Sarah Barry from One Care Vermont say that, that they, they are collecting, okay, they are collecting revision surgery. Readmission to the hospital is just what everybody does so that season. It doesn't ever happen in Vermont, ever. What happens in Vermont is revision surgery. You can count revision surgery if you want to. And as far as doing anything about it, you can, you can the whole reason why that Act 48 is so powerful and gives the Green Mountain Care Board power that dwarfs anything that any state in the union has, okay, is that is in order specifically in order to solve this problem. If you have a if you have a place which is doing you're doing now, you've got half a million people, six hundred thousand people, you're doing twelve out of fourteen hospitals doing hip replacements. No no sensible policy person is ever going to think that that makes a bit of sense. So I don't believe any of it. I mean, the reality is it's too dangerous for hospitals. They don't dare to do this stuff. You and and if you and the, the question then becomes: even if you have that, you have some data right now in your that you got last fall. Okay, that tells you here are four hospitals. I can't remember which one. 
Okay, but they're right in your data system. You they, these you hired these consultants, and they told you here are four hospitals that just doing doing surgeries that they should not be doing. Can you do anything about it? Of course you can. That's because the whole way that you control this system is through the budgets. The thing I and and you know people of public. The, the whole United States, the hospital industry in the United States is terrified, okay, terrified of actually looking at quality outcomes. Nobody, they look at checking boxes. Did you give the, did you do this? Did you do that? Did you take their temperature? Did you turn up and stand up and turn around three times? Did you do this? Did all things that you need to do. Well, the, what they don't look at is what the outcome is. And if you go, if you want to do this, you're going to have to get the outcomes. Thank you. Thank you, Ham. Michelle, I see you have your hand up. I do. I just want to um, clarify that the hospital-wide readmission measure is to the same or a different hospital, so it it is both ways. That's all. Okay. Is there other public comment? Is there other public comment? Hearing none, uh, I really want to thank uh, Allie and Kathy and everyone who worked on this project. Um, and, you know, I'm a little bit more um, optimistic that the results of this um, could be very meaningful. So, um, nobody wants to have bad outcomes. And the discussion of those will help everyone come to um, decisions that will try to minimize um, that from happening. So um, it's very important information and uh, quality is one of the three pillars of our mission here at the board. And so um, we'll continue to work with uh, you on this uh, very important effort. So thank you. Thank you so much for having me. And I realized that I omitted the final slide, which is my contact info for public comment. I'll include that in the chat. Thank you. Great. And uh, we'll make sure that gets posted on our website as well. Okay. So with that, is there any old business to come before the board? Hearing none, is there any new business to come before the board? Hearing none, is there a motion to adjourn? So moved. Second. It's been moved and seconded to adjourn. All those in favor of the motion, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed, please signify by saying nay. Thank you everyone and have a great rest of the day.